I was invited to give a TEDx talk about the economy, but I'm not an economist, nor am I an activist or an environmentalist. I work as a community manager, which means that I create networks. I try to find people from different backgrounds that all share the same dream, and I try to empower them so that we can make a, um, so that we can make a collective change. And I guess the reason why I have become a connector is because I haven't felt connected to myself and others in the first place. This connection started at an early age. The relationship with my father was a rocky one. We lived in different countries and we only had contact via letters. And as I grew older, I was hoping that one day we could meet face to face to work out our differences and finally reconnect. And when I was 15 years old, I remember it like it was yesterday, I started at new high school. I was ready to make new friends. It had been the most beautiful summer with lots of sunshine and ice cream. And I was excited and curious about this new chapter. And then I was walking home, full of gossip to share with my mother. But then I opened the door to my mother's house. She looked serious. She told me to sit down. She said she had bad news. I felt like I was listening to someone speaking with earphones in. Her voice sounded muffled and, and far away. She said that my father had been in a severe accident. She had to break the news to me that my father was found dead. Have you ever received bad news about a loved one? It feels like you're suffocating. You can't think. Sometimes you can't even feel. And to me, it felt like I was disconnecting completely to myself and others. I felt like my world was collapsing, so I was disconnecting. And I only made it harder to myself. I buried myself in schoolwork, I set myself big goals with high standards, anything to not feel that feeling. And I remember my mom saying once to me, Jenny, just relax and enjoy life, don't be so hard on yourself. But I just couldn't. I had to run away from those feelings. I had to seek a career, be strict with myself, have those rules, and I had decided there was no more time to be a teenager. So basically, I was disconnected. But most importantly, I was in denial. And let me tell you, living in denial is comfortable. We've all done it. And I think it manifests itself mostly in our personal lives, like my experience with managing or mismanaging my grief. And the reason why I wanted to share this story with you today with a group of complete strangers is because I see more and more people running away from themselves to live in denial. And this has major consequences. Because what I came to realize was, to my surprise, how selfish this was. My denial, your denial, wasn't just impacting my mother, my sister, my friends, it was also impacting mother nature. Because just as I was not listening to my body, so do we continue running business as usual and only treat symptoms instead of looking at the root causes of our problem. Just as I was crossing my personal boundaries, so do we keep crossing planetary boundaries, destroying nature. So it's now 15 years later, and 31 years old, and summers are really sunny. And according to United Nations, we have less than eight years left. Eight years to avert the worst consequences of our climate and social crisis. There's no more time to live in denial. There's no more time to be selfish. So we need to wake up and realize how disconnected we have become. I forgot to say that actually when I was still young and my father was still alive, he used to send me loads of presents. Every Christmas I would receive 20 packages, all wrapped in shining wrapping paper, different sizes and colors. But I felt like I was drowning. I didn't need those presents. I felt like I felt more disconnected to him than ever and I didn't understand why he wouldn't just come and visit me. So I came to the conclusion that he was a selfish man. And to some extent, you can also compare our current economic system to a selfish man. A selfish man who has forgotten how to take care of his child. Instead of feeding his child, and in the case of the economy, the citizens of Mother Earth, he feeds his addiction for never-ending GDP growth. Instead of listening to his heart, he listens to his ego, striving for more profit and success. Instead of looking after his garden, he destroys the lungs of our world by cutting down the Amazon rainforest. Instead of taking responsibility for his own mess, he dumps his waste onto his neighbor's doorstep. 
our economy is like a dad who had forgotten the real values of life, who keeps sending you presents when all you want is connection and love. So now we're here, and I want to take you on a journey from disconnection to reconnection. And to solve big problems, it helps to break them down into little steps. So let's first start at the bigger issues and then work our way back to see what you and I can do to really make a difference. So where do we see the disconnection on a global level? We have created systems of colonialism, slavery, resource extraction, labor exploitation, capitalism, patriarchy, so that we in the global north can build ourselves castles. And now we have left the global south with the effects of climate change and no resources to save their communities. The people who are hardest hit are the people who have the least responsible. It's people of color, women, and indigenous communities that will be affected the most. And it's happening already. I mean, just think of all the climate refugees that have to leave their countries and search for safer places. Think of the sacrifice they have to make. They have to leave behind everyone they love, everything they own, and the country they were born and raised in. 90% of world's children breathe toxic air. 60% of wild animals have been wiped out. And yet, the richest 1% go fly to space for $5 billion and emit 300 tons of CO2 just to entertain themselves. How disconnected have we become? What if we imagine a different world? A world of justice and well-being, where both nature and humans can thrive. And this is where the donut economy comes in. Kate Rayworth, British economist and creator of the donut economy, has provided us with a new way of thinking, a new mindset. And I'm going to try and explain that to you via two ropes. So, well, that's a long rope. <laughs> All right, so if you imagine a donut, if you imagine a hole, the hole in, in the middle where I'm standing right now is where you don't want to be. This is where people do not have access to healthcare, education, housing, energy, water, gender equality, etc. So the goal of the donut is to leave nobody falling short in this hole. And this inner circle represents the social foundation, and it's actually defined as actually the 12 social dimensions of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which means that all world's governments have agreed upon them, which means that everyone has a claim to those. But there's another circle, which represents the ecological ceiling, the planetary boundaries, which were defined by Earth system scientists. Okay, remember, we want to get out of the hole and into the donut, into the safe and just space. So this is how far we can go. This is how much pressure we can put on the planet. And this is when we overshoot. And we already cause climate change, biodiversity loss, lands, conversion, nitrogen loading. So the goal is to get into the donut, into the safe and just space where people do have access to the social dimensions and where we do not cause harm to the planet. It's about meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. And I can imagine that this still sounds too theoretical, so let me try and explain this via a city level. Amsterdam is the first city in the world that has officially embraced a donut on a city level. And as it's the first city in the world, it's still trying to find out what it means to get into the donut, to live within balance, to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. But there are already amazing things happening. For example, during the COVID-19 crisis, the region of Amsterdam was struggling with borders being closed, not being able to export, so there was a lot of food left over. At the same time, there were numerous families that were in a hole. They did not have access to food. And this is how the Farmers for Neighbors initiative was born. Farmers with the surplus of food provided poorer families, and this way food was now wasted and families were fed. Another example is the social housing crisis in Amsterdam. There are a lot of people in the hole in Amsterdam. They do not have access to affordable housing. It's impossible to buy a house, and it gets impossible to rent. And I think it's a question of ownership. Who owns the land? Who owns the houses? Is it locals, or is it foreign investors? There's a lot of foreign investors coming to Amsterdam, invest in real estate, which drives up prices, 
There's a lot of speculation going on. But the Varen is a beautiful example to address this question, this question of ownership. It's a housing cooperative of 50 different people from diverse backgrounds, and they co-own the land, they co-own the houses, they share facilities, everything they learn in the process, they make accessible to everyone, so they're distributive by design, but they're also regenerative, because they think of nature, they actually think of bi biodiversity, they think of how can we make sure that a neighborhood is not putting pressure on nature. And a final example is donut education. The Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences and its biggest faculty, the business faculty, is actually using the donut as a starting point to explain to students what this new economy is all about. And Kate Raverth, Kate Raverth is actually a professor of practice at our university. And she's inspiring teachers and researchers to maybe even change the curriculum. And I think with more than 45,000 students at the entire university, we can equip the new generation to really change the system. You might be sitting there thinking, well, great, Amsterdam's taking action, but I'm just one person. Well, let me tell you, you are not alone, and you are not too small to make a difference. If we combine forces, if we join communities and movements, we can really make a difference. Because you can already see a, a beautiful, well, there's already a mindset shift happening, right? People do connect, people do join communities. Because up until now, we were actually living in a society where people did not think in communities. People were described as homo economicus, the selfish man who stands alone, money in his hand, calculator in head, and ego in heart. But what if this description of homo economicus was an illusion? What if rather than hateful, we're loving human beings? What if rather than independent, we are dependent on each other? And I think one beautiful example is a movement in Amsterdam. It's a donor movement with more than 600 people that all want to co-create a socially just and ecologically safe city. And as the community manager of this movement, I'm trying to find the different people, connect them and empower them so, they can, so that we can get into the donor. Well, and what I find even more beautiful is that Amsterdam is not the only city and the donor movement is not the only donor movement in the world. There are more than 30 cities right now that are trying to find out what it means to live within balance. Think of Berlin, Barcelona, Copenhagen, Brussels, Corozao, California, Berlin, Melbourne, Sydney, and so on. So I really and truly believe that communities and movements, connectors, can really create a domino effect, a ripple effect. So having talked about the global level, the global disconnection, having talked about the city, community level, I want to talk about the big elephant in the room. You and me. Because I think that you are probably just as disconnected as our current economic system. Just think of the way we approach life. First thing in the morning, we grab our phone to read the latest news. On our way to work, we grab our earphones to listen to podcasts. When we come home, we don't say hello to our partner. We say he hello to our laptop and watch Netflix and YouTube. When we feel troubled or lonely, we scroll for social media, we consume things we don't need, and when we're tired, we don't go to bed. No, we consume more information. It seems like we have become addicted to instant gratifications, distraction, anything to not feel the feelings. And it feels like we have forgotten what it feels like to do nothing and sit in silence. And according to French philosopher Blaise Pascal, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. So let's try this out and sit in silence for one minute. How uncomfortable do you feel? <laughs> Seems like we have become so disconnected from ourselves that it even feels uncomfortable sitting in silence for one single minute. And this wasn't even a minute. So if we cannot connect back to ourselves and find out what it means to live in balance, how will we ever be able to connect the social with the ecological problems, let alone start fixing them? So I think there's still a lot of work to do and improvements to be made, but most importantly, there's hope. 
hope that if we embark on a journey of reconnection, we can fix some of those issues. So I want to leave, I want to leave you with three suggestions. On an individual level, start connecting back to yourself. Listen to your body. Your body knows so much more than your ego. Go for walks in nature, practice mindfulness, and once you remember what you really need in life, what makes you feel balanced and makes you feel within the boundaries, within your own boundaries, let your voice be heard. On a community and city level, join existing neighborhood initiatives or co-create your own donor movements. And once we connect all these different movements across borders, we can create a global movement and actually put pressure on global corporations and governments. So please don't forget, we have less than 100 months left. 100 months to avert the worst consequences of our climate and social crisis. There's no more time to lean back, stay comfortable, and live in denial. Get uncomfortable, look yourself in the mirror, and ask yourself the question, what can I do now to connect back to live in balance? All I can advise you is to reconnect as soon as possible, because you never know when the day might come that you arrive home and to be told by a loved one that it's simply too late. Thank you very much.